in our profession. With the right knowledge and experience, the sky's the limit. And whilst we know the letters after your name are an important sign of standards, professionalism and trust, it's not all we're about. We're also focused on furthering our members' careers by giving you access to a community of like-minded professionals, all bound by the same code of ethics. There's newsletters, technical papers, podcasts, and so much more great content to facilitate your CPD. Like hundreds of regular face-to-face -face meetings and digital events, making it easy to stay on top of industry trends and to network with members all over the country. Our societies mean that whether you're a broker, claims, or underwriting professional, our approach is tailored for you. And with membership, you can work towards chartered status for a place amongst the experts in your field. If you have knowledge to share or want to learn, you can sign up to our e-mentoring platform to connect and exchange ideas and support. And not forgetting the perks save on a range of products and services or access our legal helpline for free confidential advice. Get more from your membership today. Hi everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, my name is Matthew Hall, um, I'll just be making the intro and then I'll be joining you a little later on uh, for the Q&A as well. Uh, before we proceed, I just wanted to uh, highlight a few pieces of, uh, of housekeeping here. Um, I don't propose to go through this entire slide, but just to pick out the important points. Um, in case you're struggling to see the slides or the panelists today, uh, you can move and resize many of the windows on your screen to fit your particular needs. Um, and for those of you logging this session as CPD, which of course we should all be doing, um, the CPD certificate can be found in the engagement tools. You can download that once this webinar has finished. Today's session will conclude with a moderated question and answer session. Uh, you can ask questions through the Q&A box at any time during the discussion. So there's no need to wait until the end and, and risk forgetting the fantastic question you had. Uh, feel free to send them in as we go along, um, and I'll do my best to ask our guests as many of them as possible at the end. Um, if you have any issues with functionality or, or navigation today, you can find lots of support in the help section of the engagement tools at the bottom of your screen. Um, with that out of the way, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the role of the Financial Ombudsman Service, and particularly how both brokers and insurers can interact effectively with them to achieve positive outcomes. Um, to that end, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome today Roger Flaxman and Michael Wilson from Flaxman Partners. Um, and in the two of them, we've, we've got a couple of real experts to guide you through this subject matter. So. I'll put you in their very capable hands. As I say, I'll be back for the Q&A at the end. Um, so just another quick reminder there to send in any questions you have uh, via the question box on your screen. Um, so Roger and Michael, over to you. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm uh, just waiting waiting for Roger to uh, make a few introductory remarks. We, uh, we seem to have lost him, that's the problem. Um, I can hear you. Okay, Roger, when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Let's hope that this is now connected. <laughs> um, good morning to you all and welcome uh, once again to our webinar in partnership with the CII. There are few things in life that create more stress for us than waiting for the insurance company to pay our claim. But although we're all in the business, I'm sure we've all had um, a closely held experience of that dreadful wait 
in eager anticipation of payday. So when it doesn't happen, or when we get offered something that we don't think is fair, we can very quickly get angry. Long gone are the days when we can pick up the phone to that nice person that sold us our insurance. And so not only are we angry about the unfairness we perceive, but we're now doubly angry that we can't speak to anybody and we can do nothing about it. That is the reality for uh, everybody in the modern age, I think, in modern times, and we're just going to have to get used to it. Um, as you, most of you will know, in our sector, the FOS was founded in 2001 to deal with this uh, growing problem. And it was undoubtedly a good idea at the time. And in principle, I mean, it remains a good idea. But 20 years on, the cracks are definitely beginning to show in what was supposed to be a free and fairly balanced dispute resolution service in the Goliaths of the insurance industry and the Davids of the rest of the world. The overarching problem with the complaints process is that the starting point is a complaint. Most people will see a complaint as at the beginning of an argument, and no one, of course, likes losing an argument. So the starting point is often a hostile rant about all the things that upset us, but not necessarily a constructive start to resolving um, a dispute or even a disappointment. So we have to take these things into, um, into, into consideration when we're talking about complaint processes. We're in the rare position of seeing dozens of complaint letters and responses from insurance company compliance or customer relations officers. Invariably, they are formal, legalistic, unfriendly, mostly negative. Of course, we don't see very often the responses uh, that say, Dear Mrs B, you're quite right to have complained about your matter, and we're not only going to uphold your complaint, but we will also compensate you for your stress and inconvenience. Now, we know those letters exist, so we're not going to pretend otherwise. But we also know from experience that some companies send more of the negative kind than do others. And so the big question is to ask whether there is an alternative to making a complaint that will yield a better outcome. Well, we know there is because that's our daily bread and we've been doing it for 20 years. Now, of course, the complaint process is written into the compliance regulations and we have no intention of dismissing or, uh, or challenging those, none at all. However, there is a pathway of potential resolution of disputes that can avoid even the necessity to make a complaint and the purpose of this webinar is to let you into some of the little secrets of how that works. So, Michael, would you like to kick off with the um, reminding our audience of the learning objectives? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that introduction, uh, Roger. Let me just go through these learning objectives uh, to appreciate the legal framework for complaints handling under the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000. For brokers to know when to negotiate and when to complain, for insurers to identify early opportunities to resolve disputed claims without the insured feeling the need to resort to the complaints pro procedure, to understand the remit of the Financial Ombudsman Service, and to have a working knowledge of the legal aspects of an FOS final determination. Now, we always like real life examples and um, the slide here is flagging up a, a case we're going to look at in a little bit more detail later, but it just sets the scene that we, we have a client, a Mrs. Harris, uh, who's having some uh, problems with her house and her subsidence claim started 20 years ago. And she's had four different loss adjusters. She's had a whole series of very poor contractors, and currently she can't even fill her kettle. That's where she is at the moment. So we'll, that just sets the scene of the sort of uh, problems that we come across from time to time. Um, there are some um, technical issues here that we're just going to run through. There are quite a lot of slides that just give you the background for the um, 
the framework for complaints. Uh, don't worry if you can't uh, take them all down because we're going to be issuing a, a fact sheet and um, you'll be able to get all the information. There we go. So uh, legal framework for complaints. So it's, it's, it's under the Financial Services and Markets Act. Um, you should be responsible. Uh, you should be familiar with the DISP rules, uh, which include things such as treating uh, complainants fairly, complaints handling procedures and the complaints uh, time rules. That's where all the rules and regulations are to be found. Um, when a claim goes wrong, the, the, the view we're taking here is that um, it's always better to discuss and to negotiate wherever possible. And so what we're, what we're saying um, to brokers, just bear with me a moment, would you? Um, Sorry, I think the, the slides were slightly out of order there. But when a claim goes wrong, discuss and negotiate wherever possible. So we're saying to brokers, don't make this look like a complaint just because you're challenging uh, a decision. And we're saying to insurers, don't always make a challenge into a complaint. So we're, we're saying to brokers, um, only complain once the negotiation has come to an end. And um, I just want to bring Roger in here and say, how do we get into this situation, Roger, where um, a broker starts to negotiate perhaps an improved uh, claim settlement or uh, tries to override a repudiation? Uh, so sometimes these complaints become complaints rather too quickly, don't they? Yes, well, I think that's probably because we have introduced into the industry a complaint process um, and also because the modern way of insurance intermediation has removed quite a lot of the face-to-face -face relationship that once existed between brokers and underwriters. Um, a, a very important point to start from here is this, that if an underwriter has made a decision about a claim, on the face of it, he wants to stick with it. On the other hand, a good broker will probably say, look, Mr. Underwriter, you're an underwriter, I'm a broker, but we're both qualified insurance practitioners. We're both as experienced as each other. And I don't actually agree with your decision. Can we talk about it? Now, at one time, particularly in my day of broking, uh, which goes back a long time, uh, that's what you did. You said, I'm not sure about this. Can we have a chat? OK, what do you want to chat about? It's more difficult nowadays, but it's not impossible. And I think the point is this, that once the underwriter has said, this is my determination of the claim, the broker, the modern broker, I think, feels more inclined to have to say, well, I'm going to have to go and punch this chap on the nose in order to make him listen to me. And what we're saying, Mike, is no, you don't. In fact, it's the last thing you should do. But if you've got a very good reason for saying, I think that decision is unfair, and, you know, Michael and I will talk to you about some of those later on because we see dozens all the time. Um, sometimes they're not unfair, but they haven't really been thought through as to what the implications are of that decision. And why this is so important is that insurance is not a game. Insurance is actually um, the lifeblood to some people. When somebody loses something uh, or has something damaged, they need it back. If you put yourself in the position of a claimant, when you've lost your car or when you've lost your, you know, your garage or whatever it might be, or your business, um, you want it back. And you don't want somebody writing you a short, a rather stiff letter saying, on this occasion, we're unable to help you. Is there anything else we can help you with today? It doesn't go down terribly well. So no, right, what right. we're looking to do is to say with a complaint, when a complaint comes in, before you make a complaint, let's start with actually, is there a negotiation to be made, to be had? And in our opinion, there is. And Mike can carry on and say how. <laughs> so, 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 Roger, uh, just picking up on that point, um, yeah. one would hope that there would always be an opportunity to negotiate uh, a claims decision. 
Uh, so if you, if you take a, a claim that's just been repudiated and the, the broker or the individual feels that it's the wrong decision, what we're saying is let's have a, 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 an open and constructive discussion rather than going to the complaints process. But yes. so, some on this webinar today will be uh, concerned quite rightly about the compliance aspects of that. Yes. So it, it, it does raise the question of what exactly is a complaint? Because if uh, a regulated business uh, receives a complaint but doesn't actually treat it as a formal complaint, then they're not going to be compliant with the rules, are they? So how do, how do we fit in this uh, negotiation stage, if you like, in such a way that we can all be uh, confident that we're working within the rules and that we're being compliant? Well, I think very practically, when you're negotiating an insurance, when you're negotiating the placement of it or an amendment of it, you're doing that by negotiation, aren't you, by definition? Now, and, a, and, and a claims matter is only an extension of that negotiation process. The broker is entirely um, entitled and really should go back to an insurer and say, look, on this claim, I'm not sure you're right, can we talk about it? Now, that's a negotiation. If you get to the stage where the, um, the insurer says, for the last time, I'm not discussing this, then that becomes, I believe, the beginning of a complaint. But what um, the disc rules say is that um, the um, a complaint is an expression of dissatisfaction. Well, you know, you can interpret that in a million ways. The fundamental point is this. If you get to the point where negotiation is not possible, then I think the complaint process kicks in. The important thing is to start with the negotiation process. OK, well, that's very helpful. Thank you for that, Roger. Now, um, we just need to cover the, um, the basics of the uh, complaints process uh, with particular regard to the Financial Ombudsman Service. So it's important that uh, we know who qualifies for the scheme. We need to know what the time limits are. We need to know the award limits and we need to know the procedure. So we'll just very briefly run through each of these headings. As I say, I'm going to run through them fairly quickly and there will be a fact sheet available uh, afterwards. So um, the Financial Ombudsman Service is able to uh, accept uh, referrals from consumers, bearing in mind that it was for consumers that the uh, insurance ombudsman service the the, the the first ombudsman scheme was set up for it didn't really apply to businesses at all at one time so consumers tends to be the focus but these days um businesses uh, also qualify so the uh, the business must have a, an annual turnover of less than six and a half million now it's, it's interesting that this is still referred to as being a, a small to medium-sized enterprise i think to a lot of people, six and a half million is, is actually quite a large turnover. So there are perhaps more business uh, policyholders who qualify than one would normally think. Um, and then, of course, there is the, also there is another test that the SME must satisfy one of the of the of the next two tests, and that is that it must employ fewer than fifty employees and, and has a, a balance sheet of below five million. So that does actually admit quite a high level of claims from. Uh, businesses. Uh, know the time limits. Um, the Ombudsman cannot consider a complaint if the complainant refers it to the uh, service more than six years after the event complained of, or if later, three years from the date on which the complainant became aware. Um, in general insurance, it's probably quite unusual um, for uh, complaints to be made uh, about something that's almost six years ago, but it, it does sometimes happen. And and it can happen, uh, particularly for an intermediary, uh, either on the life and pension side or the uh, general insurance side. And um, I think intermediaries ought to just keep these time limits uh, in mind, because if it's established that the complaint has been made outside of the time limits, then the intermediary is under no obligation at all to consider the uh, the facts of the complaint. Uh, the complaint can simply be uh, rejected on the basis that it's out of time. Um, know the award limits. Um, there's still 
quite a lot of confusion uh, about these award limits. The current limit is £355,000, which is a considerable increase uh, on what it was uh, originally. And uh, I've shown the, uh, the older limits there for older claims. Um, the, if, if you're involved in, in uh, putting in complaints on behalf of a policyholder, and if you're dealing with a particularly large claim, which is not unusual these days, now that SMEs are included, you, you really need to give some serious thought before you put a complaint in, and certainly before it's referred to the Ombudsman, as to whether or not these award limits are going to cause you a problem. So, for instance, if you've got a claim of a million pounds, what is your attitude going to be if you get an award of 355,000? Is your client going to be satisfied with that? Or would they have preferred a different route to have been followed from the outset? So very careful consideration needs to be given to the um, larger complaint. Now, the procedure, I think we're probably all familiar with this, that the complaint must be sent to the business first of all. The business has up to eight weeks to respond. Then there's the final decision letter. Uh, and then uh, any referral to the FOS must be made within six months of that um, final uh, decision. And uh, I think we're all also aware of the fact that there's quite a long allocation time in the FOS. Uh, you, you can be sat in a queue for uh, maybe six months before anybody will even look at it. And so it's important that people's uh, expectations are managed. Now, um, we've got one or two uh, examples that Roger and I would like to talk to you about. And um, the first one was for a Mrs. Robbins. And, and the reason that we'd like to talk to you about these examples is, is just to demonstrate that sometimes there is a value in not going straight to the complaints process. So uh, Mrs. Robbins uh, was quite elderly. Uh, she, uh, she and the family made the difficult decision that she was going to be admitted uh, to a residential home. And um, so the, the, the family had to notify the insurance company that the property would be unoccupied. And um, as you would expect, the insurance company uh, imposed a condition uh, to uh, minimise loss. And one of the conditions was a requirement to keep the central heating on uh, constantly at a temperature of 10 degrees. Uh, unfortunately, the family had misunderstood the condition, and although they set the thermostat at 10 degrees, uh, the heating was only uh, set to come on uh, for two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. Uh, so when, when there was a burst pipe uh, in, the, in the loft and a lot of damage uh, caused, uh, the insurers uh, repudiated the claim on the grounds that the condition had not been followed. And, of course, at first sight, that seems a perfectly reasonable decision. But the, uh, the family brought it to us, and we, we, we had a look at it, and we realised that um, in the loft where the, the burst pipe had, had, had occurred, um, they had a, a depth of insulation that was about double what you would normally expect. And so therefore, uh, in this case, um, we felt that even if the, the heating had been kept on permanently, it wouldn't have got through the insulation and therefore protected the pipe in the loft. Um, so we had a situation where we knew that there had been a breach of the condition, but did it really make much difference? So instead of going through a complaints process, we, we had a couple of discussions with the insurer. And Roger, I think I think we, we found they, they, they were quite open to having a conversation with us rather than it being adversarial. Well, they were, and that was the great thing about it. But one of the things that we, we said to them is, look, um, your customer, in this case, is an 85-year-old lady, and your um, requirement the uh, the heating on didn't really say very much to guide her as to what keeping the heating on would mean in practice and what she did we, she thought was reasonable now you can't really take that away from her 
because she didn't really have in mind, and this is one thing I, I know that we bang on about this, but I think we should. Um, it's all very well, us in the industry, saying that the policyholder should read the policy and understand it, but very often they don't. And very often the language used in, uh, particularly in endorsement policies, is almost a, an insurance shorthand. And time and time and time again in our business, we come across endorsements that Michael and I, between us, have got you know, nigh on 100 years of experience. And we don't know what they mean. We, of course, we do know what they mean, but they are so imprecise. And what we said to the insurer is that actually what she did was to comply with your obligation. She didn't do it in the way you had in mind. And you didn't know about her loft or you didn't know about her insulation. So can we, and this is the way, this is what I'm talking about, Nico, can we close the gap? Can we do something? Because she wasn't really in breach. She was only in breach in our minds as experts in the industry because it wasn't what we had in mind. Is that fair enough, Mike? Yeah, and, and, in, and in this case, um, I think we settled for about two-thirds of the claim. Yeah, so in other words, there was a, a recognition there that uh, the insured probably hadn't done all that they should have done, but the decision was harsh and, and, and everybody was happy with the two-thirds settlement. Now, you would never have got that result by taking it through the complaints process. That's what we're saying. No. Well, this is one of the things and, I just want to add to this because, Mike, it's the, the if you like, the epicentre of this subject is that a complaint is by definition beginning of an adversarial process once you start on an adversarial process very very difficult to go back so quite often when we're sending in um, letters to insurers on behalf of our clients we start off by saying this is not a complaint please do not record this as a complaint and if they do we send it straight back and we go up the line and say this is not a complaint this is a discussion this is a negotiation and to be fair, 90% of insurers say, OK, fine, yeah, OK, what do you want to say? We don't get fucked. That's all. But once it goes into the complaints process, it goes away largely from the people that you really can have a negotiation with. And that's the point we want to make. And this was a very good example of doing it. Well, we, we, we had another case for Jones Properties Limited. This was, uh, as its name implies, it a, a company that owned uh, and let uh, a number of commercial properties and um, in this particular case there was um, a, a shop unit uh, and again it was a, a burst pipe claim and there was some doubt as to whether or not the, the 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 restaurant as it was as to whether or not it was actually occupied at the time and and mm -hmm. and the the insured was having a little bit of difficulty in uh, fulfilling its duty to satisfy the insurer that uh, there had in fact been a valid claim so there was a little bit of a, a grey area there that needed investigating. But before that was investigated any further, the insurer discovered that the one of the directors of Jones Properties Limited uh, had been a director of a, of a previous business that had gone into liquidation. And this had never been disclosed at the commencement of the insurance. And so the insurers uh, notified us that uh, they were minded to void the policy. Now, that in itself is not a particularly unusual set of circumstances. And incidentally, um, Roger, we, we've, we've got on our agenda to have a, a future webinar on the whole subject of past insolvencies because it's quite a, yeah. a murky yeah. area and it's something that we, we, we need to yeah. look at in some detail. So I'm not going to go into too much of the detail here except to say that when we looked at the statement of fact, we discovered that the, the statement or the question on the statement of fact didn't actually ask the right questions to elicit the information that the director had been involved in a previous company that had gone into liquidation. They, they, they had actually framed the question in the wrong way. And so therefore... Yeah, we this is actually, you know, this is quite common. That's quite common. Yeah, it's, it's, We've seen it's what quite you call a lot a limiting, of situations. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the issue of limiting questions and the principle of waiver, mm. which we don't, we don't want to go into just now. But we, we, we felt that the, the, the thought that the insurer might void was, was, was going to be a mistake. So we, we entered into negotiations with the insurer. Um, we, we had to concede that um, more work had to be done to justify the claim. 
but we we felt that uh, the void, uh, avoidance would not be valid and we had a discussion about it and because Jones Properties owns uh, a lot of properties we we also discovered that the a potential avoidance would be more harmful to the company than not having the claim paid and so we we talked to the insurer and said well we th we think the sensible thing to do would be for the insured to um, uh, rescind its claim, not not to proceed with it, to agree that the claim wouldn't be paid, um, if if you the insurer would uh, not go ahead and void the policy. So that was a pragmatic solution, and and everybody agreed to that, and everybody was was happy with it. Um, it left the insurer. But had but had the had it gone in. Sorry, sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to interrupt. No. Now, had it gone into a complaint process, you could never have come to that conclusion. And in fact, no, I think they would right. have lost because I think there was, there was, there was not really a good defence uh, to the occupancy. So uh, that's another example of why the negotiation, if you can do it, um, it can really pay dividends, and it does wonders for brokers' reputation to be able to say, "I've talked to the insurer." Um, now, let me just say this: I know how difficult some brokers find it to be able to get to somebody that can make a decision. That's one of the reasons we're here, because we often can. Quite a lot of brokers will just phone us up and say, look, what do you think about this? Um, and sometimes we just tell them what we think and they go off and do it. So they don't always need to come actually to us. But the important thing is to recognise that to talk, talk, talk is far, far, far more powerful um, in our business now than it, uh, than just sending in what really becomes a tick box complaints process that is likely to go to the FOS. It could take two to three years sometimes to go through the process. Whereas what we're tending to do with the negotiation is to resolve most of these things within, within six months, quite often. Michael. I think the, 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 the other thing to say is that um, although we, we are invariably instructed by the policyholder, um, we like to think that when we have these opportunities to negotiate, that it, it suits the insurer as well. We're not anti-insurer. Mm. Mm. In fact, quite mm. often, uh, insurers uh, express appreciation for the, the process that we've been through. And um, quite often, everybody goes away happy at the end. Um, just a, a few more comments about uh, Mrs. Harris and her 20-year uh, subsidence claim. I think it's been an awful process uh, for this lady, and I, I said that she can't fill her kettle. Well, she can. So if she wants to fill her kettle, she goes outside the back door to her uh, separate garage where she got a tap in the garage. She fills the kettle. Then she takes it back into the home and has to take it upstairs to where there's a, a suitable point to plug it in. And she's been living like this for weeks. And... Uh, she's in her early 80s, so she would have only been in her early 60s when the claim started, and she's sort of uh, grown old with the claim. And actually, there's not a lot wrong with the claim itself. We, we all know that subsidence claims can take a long, long time to be resolved, so we're not, we're not saying that the insurer... Um, is, is not honouring the contract. They are. In fact, it, the job is almost complete. But uh, before we got involved, Mrs. Uh, Harris, every time she was frustrated because contractors didn't turn up or because they were incompetent or because the loss adjuster was slow or every time she got exasperated, she put in a complaint and then obviously a complaint response was sent. And uh, she must have put in three or four complaints during this 20-year period with the result that she's really cheesed off with the insurers and the insurers are also exasperated with her. So there's a pretty much a, a total breakdown in the relationship. Uh, fortunately, the claim is almost finished, but what we're saying here is that even uh, an insurance claim, which is fully covered, there's no dispute over the um, uh, liability in, indemnity is being granted.
But every now and then there's a case where a claim just goes off the rails. And when that happens, for all sorts of reasons, it doesn't need the complaints process to put it right. And Roger, you and I were talking about this and we were thinking that what would be quite good for cases like this would be some sort of um, access to a, a troubleshooter at yeah. the insurer who could identify when the claim is just not operating properly and, and get it sorted out and keep it away from the complaints process. So what, 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 what are your yes. thoughts on that, Roger? Well, um, as you know, because we've discussed it, my thoughts are it would be incredibly helpful to the industry for its front of house image and its reputation if there was somebody who was the equivalent almost of an insurance clerk of works who kept an eye on claims and occasionally went out and have a look and see how it's working in practice. Because the point is that in today's in, uh, in environment, there's nobody to talk to. And the majority of people in claims functions, whether they're lawyers, loss adjusters, or claims uh, personnel, they haven't got, it's not their job to go and see the client or to even ask how are things going. It's not their job. But we need somebody who will do that. Because when we find that you know, this lady's 85, she's lived 20 years almost with this, um, with this problem. And of course, she talks to everybody about it. And how much would it take or somebody from the insurance company, uh, you know, the, the the equivalent, if you like, of the old inspectors that we used to have until about the 1970s or 80s, or whatever it was. These were people who just wandered around and talked to the brokers and their clients. How are things going? What do you think? We don't do that anymore. But what people want in life more than ever is to be able to talk to somebody when something isn't working. And it would be very, very inexpensive and relatively quick be able to say, don't worry, uh, uh, Mrs. Robbins, we'll have that sorted out for you, and you get a, a you know, a temporary kitchen or whatever it might be, but do something that make people feel that they're valued. So I think that we ought to consider um, a recommendation to the industry overall that in addition to the complaints officer, there's a complaints troubleshooting champion who said, well, let's look at these complaints and see what it looks like in practice. I think, and I'd like to ask you this, that when you go back to the time when we visited the floods up in Doncaster, et cetera, et cetera, what was the thing you found most of all? Yes, I spent some time. We did some claims clinics in Doncaster and the wider area. It was a couple of years ago now, wasn't it, when they had all these yeah, well, floods? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have to confess I was surprised that there were so few indemnity problems most most claims were being handled we didn't come across many um fundamental problems with the coverage so that was good in, in, insurers were accepting claims and dealing with them where we had the problem was again just some of the claims going off the rails some very obstructive loss adjusters on occasion which then of course makes the insured equally obstructive because they don't feel they're being heard. And I think some of these claims in Doncaster were, were classic cases where uh, it was really crying out for an intervention from somebody who's aside from uh, the claims handler, who can say, this claim's not going well, let's see what we can do to put it right. And uh, it's very difficult yeah. to get a claim back on track. We did have a case which I think some of you listening will uh, remember we talked about a couple of years ago. And this was another substance matter um, of two houses which were joined together and they were built on a slope up from a road. And they'd spent um, 15 years sliding down that slope and gradually tearing each other apart. All that time, the two loss adjusters would not agree, could not agree on how to underpin or how to uh, remediate the properties. Um, we got in, in, uh, involved in year 16 or, or thereabouts. Um, and these people had had children and sent them off to university before they got their house repaired. Now, if you think of things in that kind of scale, it really isn't a good advertisement for our industry. And all it was about was two lots of justices not agreeing on the process. Now, if both of the insurers had had 
um, what we call a troubleshooting champion, go out and knock heads together. I don't think that would have happened, but they don't. And it was just left to go on, complaint, complaint, complaint. Um, they spent, I think, just short of £100,000 paying a loss assessor to assist them. And he, he, he failed totally, which is when we came in afterwards. Now, the point is that um, a claim is all about putting you back in the position you were before the loss. It's not just about the money. And that's, I think, one of the big, if you like, black holes in our industry at the moment. Um, as people have been saying for a long time now, insurance is just a numbers game. Well, it isn't to the people that buy it. So, Mike, I think we ought to move on to a quick touch on the legal aspect. Would you like to yes, that's have a look at that? Good. Um, we, we, we're not here to um, say to people, don't use the Financial Ombudsman Service. We're just advocating an intermediate step of negotiation, really. But um, we've picked up the fact that um, whereas uh, the FOS, when it uh, was brought into being, was intended to be a way of um, giving a, a fair hearing to both sides, we're finding, aren't we, Roger, that more and more um, businesses are being represented by their lawyers. Um, we, we, well, the, the, the insurer's lawyers. The, yes. the insurer's lawyers, yes. So what's the, happening yes, is or, going to the FOS... Yeah. Uh, and the insurers are saying, I'll oh, give it to our lawyer to deal with. Now, that was never the intention. And, of course, whereas, as I said in my opening remarks, the FOS was set up uh, to give the Davids of the world a sporting chance with the Goliaths of the insurance industry, if the insurers use their lawyers, then actually they're just giving Goliath an extra weapon. But the... Uh, party on the other side doesn't have that privilege and it's supposed to be a free service so to go you know, for an insurer to pay a lawyer is nothing uh, for a policyholder to pay a lawyer is probably as much as or more than the claim and probably not required at all which is you know what we've proven is that actually you don't often need a lawyer uh, you just need a good insurance professional now we are every one of us in this webinar today is an insurance professional and we shouldn't ever need frankly, except in exceptional cases, to ask um, a lawyer to negotiate an insurance claim. It should be perfectly practical, and I'm sure the CII will um, uh, will support this. If you're an ACCI or you're an FCCI or one of the steps in on the, on the way, it shouldn't require to go to somebody outside of your profession to negotiate the uh, deliverance of the contract that you negotiated. But that is what's happening, and that is actually holding up the FOS process because the people at the FOS cannot ignore a lawyer's letter. And sometimes they're very long, they're very detailed, and they go into things which are designed, really, to win the case. And what we're saying is that wasn't the original intention of the FOS, and it might be something for everybody to bear in mind that if you do go into the FOS process or you recommend your client to go into the FOS process, you may have to deal with this feature. Uh, it's worth remarking, though, that if, if the uh, insured uh, wants legal representation to even things up as part of the FOS um, process, they're not able to recover those fees, are they? No, they're not. No. Not normally, so that's, it's not quite equal. No. Um, we... Earlier flagged up the fact that uh, serious thought needs to be given if uh, a complaint is referred to the Ombudsman where it's a large claim well over the, the current award limit of 355,000. Um, Roger, can you explain what options a complainant has if they get um, a, a positive award let's say in this case, uh, up to the 355,000, but their claim is, is, is worth a million. So if they, if they get a, a positive answer well, from if the that Ombudsman, happens, what? If, yes, if they get the right answer, they can say, well, thank you very much. And then they can go back to the insurer and say, the award is against you. Would you like to pay full claim? Now, the insurer will often say, no, I won't. In which case, the option, there is an option 
for the um, for the party to say, well, I will instruct solicitors to take it up. Now we know from experience, from practical experience, that solicitors <coughs> who take on a case armed with an ombudsman's award in their pocket think it's their birthday because a lot of the work has been done and the admissions have been made. So it's quite a strong position for the insured and for the um, for the lawyer to be in. But of course it costs money. And if the insurer wants to say, well, I'm sorry, I'm simply not going to do more than I'm obliged to by the ombudsman, then they could be in for a long fight. And, and that can be expensive. Um, and then there are costs, uh, award of costs, uh, problems that go with that if you lose, which means that the lawyer will advise you to take out, uh, um, after the event, uh, insurance protection, cost protection. That has a price to go, uh, to go with it as well. So um, the option is, if you do get uh, an award, you can say to your client, well, you can accept that 350000 but it's unlikely you can get any more, or you can ask us, I ask the broker or the advisor, uh, to go and negotiate with the insurer to pay more than the award, but possibly less than the full amount of the claim. Again, a negotiation. That's how that's how you do it. And I, I, th um, I think I think it, I think the problem with that, Roger, it puts the policyholder mm -hmm. in a very very difficult position because if they've does. been offered three hundred fifty-five thousand, they have to formally reject that offer they before do. they can consider legal proceedings so that, that's, that's quite a big gamble but what you it? but what you can't do is to accept it and then go to litigation you can't do that and, and that no. is on the slide in front of you at the moment this is the case of clark and the dover and in focus asset management which specifically tested that uh, concept now it's quite a complex bit of law it is worth reading it's very easy to look up um but it uh, it is worth reading to see uh, the reason for it, but what it basically says is you can't have two bites of the cherry on the same legal matter. Um, Thank you, Roger. We, so, we, we've actually got a, uh, so I think we've we've we need to say on that, isn't it? Yeah, we, have, we, we yeah. have a fact sheet on, on this point, so if you'd like to have a copy, just get in touch. Uh, we need to move on to uh, the questions in a moment, but can I just say that uh, coming up in January, um, Flaxman's are planning a part two on our previous uh, presentation on non-disclosure and the house on the hill. And, and uh, our intention is that this may well be the launch of, uh, of a campaign to see some changes into the whole uh, issue of, of, of non-disclosure. So that's something to look forward to in, in January. But for now, it's back to you, Matthew. Thank you both. Um, really interesting, um, really interesting stuff. And uh, a few, a few questions to tackle um, for the the two of you. Um, so the the first one came in from uh, Ali, and and he asks, uh, how would you negotiate before a complaint? So so how would you know uh, if they are not satisfied? Well, I think that um, as a broker you ought to have a reasonable idea of what is a good, sensible and fair offer of a claim. And you will probably anticipate whether your customer is going to be happy with that or not. Now, you know, that's the first point. You ought to know whether it's fair and reasonable. Secondly, if they do say, well, I'm a bit disappointed with that, it's the disappointment factor that is the trigger for saying, well, OK, let's see what we can do for you. But you don't need to make a complaint. You simply say, well, I'm disappointed with that. Let's go and have a chat with the insurer. So I, I, do you think that answers the question, Ali? I should think so. We'll um, soon find out. He'll come back and tell us. <laughs> So, so one, uh, one, one question um, I had as we were, were moving through this. So uh, some time ago, I saw um, there's government proposals at the moment to, to actually halve the complaint waiting time from, from four to eight, um, from eight to four weeks, sorry. Um, what, what sort of impact do you, do you see that happening? Uh, do, you, do you think it would encourage insurers to, to seek resolution 
more efficiently, more effectively, or, or would that just lead to, to sort of increased burden on, on the FOS? Well, I think there are two halves to that question. Um, we are very aware of how it works in practice. And um, in our experience, a lot of people leave the complaint for seven and a half weeks, then do it in a hurry. And we think that's unfair, unreasonable. There are some complaints that actually, in order to give a proper and fair answer, you've got to go back and ask for questions and more information. Now, very often when we see a case, the first thing we do is to say, well, this information is missing, that information is missing. So before we actually open our mouths to anybody, let's go and find out what it is. And that can take time. So I, am, I think um, the idea of reducing it to four weeks has got some merit from the point of view of the customer, the consumer, saying, well, I've got an answer more quick, but I'm not convinced that it's going to be um, resulting in a more thorough or fairer investigation. And I think you have to go back to the um, to the proposal and say, what what is the basis for your, uh, for your recommendation for this four weeks? Because I haven't heard what it is. Thank you. Um, another question from, from Anna Morgan. Um, she asks, how would you resolve a consumer claim that had been ignored um, and notes that, that one in six claims are ignored? One in six, that's uh, Do you mean a complaint or do you mean a complaint? I, I presume it, it's written here as complaint, but I, I, I uh, written here as claim, oh, but I, I would presume yeah. complaint perhaps. Michael, you do that one. Well, I, I would think what Anna's getting at is um, similar to um, Mrs. Harris and her subsidence claim. In other words, um, things are just getting stuck. And um, this is actually what we're saying, that um, when, when nothing is happening on a claim, how, how do you get it moving? And the trouble is that Normally, you're, you're just dealing with the same claims department and you may not be dealing with the same person all the time. Um, I don't know whether it's because of uh, the period of remote working or what, but it, it does seem to be happening more and more. And mm. uh, with some insurers, if you uh, bring the, the, the problem to the attention of senior management, it just gets passed back to the claims department and, and you're going around in circles. So th there's no quick answer for Anna's question except that if insurers took up our suggestion of a, of a troubleshooter, not, not to deal with fundamental indemnity issues, but to deal with claims that have just gone off the rails, that, that might be a help. I think uh, it, it comes back also to this business that, that in the way that our industry is run at the moment, largely, it's not anybody's job. No one's given the job, given the responsibility for dealing with that issue. It's just not on the radar. Now, there are going to be some insurers who are going to be um, snarling at what I've just said because they say, well, we do. And that's fantastic if you do, but it's not what we see most of the time. We actually see those cases, of course, where it isn't happening. So it's difficult for us to judge how much it is happening. But it's still a, you know, it's a good question and it's, uh, it's, it's worthy, I think, of more thought on how to deal with it. Thank you. Um, a few comments here from uh, from Matthew, uh, a different Matthew, not not myself. Um, he describes you as, as refreshingly old fashioned, um, which uh, <laughs> which you should take as a a, uh, a, a glowing testimonial. Mm. I think refreshingly um, old. He, he, asks, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he he asks should should the motto here be be fix it, not fight it? Is that is that a good way of sort of yeah, summarizing? That's a really good way of summarizing the approach. Just put yourself in the position of your client, your customer. You know, if you're the person, and, and, and we've all been there. I mean, every one of us, I'm sure, at some stage in our life has torn our hair out trying to get to talk to somebody that can make a decision about something, whether it's the doctor or whether it's the plumber. I mean, I recently had some water damage uh, in my parents' house, and it took seven weeks to get the people that were responsible 
to uh, to do the repairs, and, and that's with the insurer's knowledge. But everybody was passing the the pattern to somebody else. Oh, we'll just do that person. We'll just do, and it it was anyway. I eventually sorted it out, and we got paid compensation for it as well. But that's because you know how to do it. The point is, we are in a position now where it is not somebody's responsibility to do something that isn't in the immediate area of their job description. And particularly in the, in the business of financial services, where it's become increasingly remote, we've said time and time again, over the last 30 or 40 years, and being old fashioned, whatever, we know this because we were there, we have got further and further and further and further away from our customers. We've got to reverse it. Can, can I just add, add, add something? Uh, Matthew, I'm very pleased to be refreshingly old fashioned. That's rather good, that. But mm. going back to uh, Mrs. Robbins with the burst pipe and the empty house, the, the, there's nothing that the insurance company did wrong when they put on the endorsement uh, with the uh, requirement for the central heating. Yeah, they were entitled to put on that endorsement. But of course, having been told that the property was empty, they posted that endorsement to the property. And we all know what happens when, when, when a property is empty and you, you, you go in perhaps once a week and you pick up all the posts, it doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. And I think sometimes it would be nice if, um, and I, I mustn't make a sweeping uh, generalization here, but it would be nice in cases like that if whoever's dealing with the matter actually put themselves in the position of the of the caller and actually did some thinking and perhaps said to this lady, you know, the daughter of the insured, I realise that you won't be going to the property every day. Would you like me to put this endorsement in an email to you? And then if you've got any problems, if you don't understand it, just give me a ring. And then at least you're doing that little bit extra to make sure that the, the person you're dealing with fully understands what it is that their, their requirements are. Mm. It's just sometimes doing that little bit of extra because you've thought it through from the perspective of the policyholder. Absolutely. And, and so, so some of these issues are really, you know, when it boils down about about customer service and, and, and understanding, um, which, which, as you mentioned earlier, I suppose, um, as we have a more sort of system driven and, and transactional approach um, is, is, is harder to do. Do you believe, or, or yes. is this uh, more about insurers not wanting to do it? No, I don't think it's not wanting. I think it's just harder to do because, the, as we know, the, the only thing we read about in the insurance industry at the moment is insure tech, which is how to make it faster. And, you know, we're saying it, it's a better client experience. Buying insurance is a bore, whoever you are, and you want to get it over with quickly. But actually, the, where insurance really comes into its own is in the claims process. It's what you're buying. And when that doesn't work, everything else tumbles down. It doesn't matter how, how speedy it was. But what we also know, and I, I will say this because I'm old enough to take the risk, um, the whole of my career, the, the claim service has been the art sally of the industry. It still is. And uh, the, the, the the term, I think, in the 70s or 80s, I seem to remember, was somebody wrote um, that the uh, claims is the shop window of the industry. Well, it still is. And the point is, isn't it ironic that, I'll tell you, I was 44 before I even saw a computer. And now there are very few people in the industry that didn't grow up with them. And we have so much information available at our fingertips. Yet with all the information and all the ways that we can impart that information, these things are still happening because we don't use it to actually cover the gap of what we really call client service. There's virtually nothing you can't do now with technology to make the customer feel that they're you know, personalised, they're, they're looked after. We, we simply don't do it. And... Our role in life is when we see these things, I would say probably only about a third of the, no, possibly a bit more, maybe between a third and a half of the cases we see are coverage dispute. Um, and the majority of the, uh, the cases are actually things have gone wrong and people have been waiting for weeks or months interminably for decisions that never come. And when they come, there's a mistake or there's a 
you know, the insurer or somebody has made a, a, a howling mistake, and then they have to go back and start again. But it's, it's the aggression with which the industry has developed its persona. And that aggression comes from tick boxes and reliance upon legal processes, where so many people say, oh, I better not say that because, you know, I'm not a lawyer. But they, they put things in a language which actually make people whistle. Now, we know how to tackle that. And if the CII wanted to do something in 2022 to address that particular problem, uh, I can tell you now, we'd be very much up for helping you do it. Because it's when people talk about client service, it's not the speed of the transaction. Nothing to do with the price. It's actually the bit that really matters, which is being connected with your customer when they need you. That's client service. Some people, I can tell you, do it brilliantly well. But a lot don't. And that's why we're here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, um, thank you very much, uh, Roger. And I, I think that's a uh, that's an excellent excellent sort of place to put a full stop on it. Really, um, we have run over slightly, and I, I apologise for that. But I think it was such a sort of um, rich discussion that it, it was well worth a couple of extra minutes. Um, so Roger and Michael have both both referred a couple of times to um, upcoming uh, upcoming webinars and also uh, some facts and information sheets. So what we'll do after this webinar is, is make sure uh, that we've clearly provided those or signposted you towards those relevant areas. Um, that just leaves me really uh, to thank uh, both Roger and Michael for, for taking the time today. Um, and also, uh, most importantly, of course, uh, thanks to you um, as the audience for, for joining us as well. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.